Good morning, afternoon or evening, everybody, and welcome to this IdeaPod Ideas Salon on the future of health, personalized, safe and convenient. Uh, if you want to have this discussion on ideapod.com, go to hashtag personalized health. Today, we will be talking with Bowhead Health experts, as well as a few experts around the world from Australia on health personalization and what it means to have our health data on the blockchain. Today, I've got with me Dr. Rhea Mehta, who is the CEO of Bowhead Health, joining us from Toronto. Her co-founder and head of product at Bowhead Health, Francisco Diaz Matoma, who's joining us from LA. We also have Dr. Lindsay Wu, the head for the Lab of Aging Research at the University of New South Wales here in Sydney in Australia, where I am. And just off screen, we have Dr. Matthew McGann, uh, who was from the University of the ANU and is a co-founder of Health Horizons, a platform that aggregates all of the health innovations around the world so that humanity can follow their progress uh, and help contribute to their realisation. So we have Mark Smith and a number of other people joining us um, in this crowdcast and also on Facebook. So if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section below or in the sidebar. We've also got Ona, oh, no, hello there from Turkey. Hello, my friend. Um, and remember, if anything interests you, feel free to ask everyone a question on this salon. Now, I guess the first one has to be to Dr. Rhea. There's a lot of talk about how um, customer experience and personalization uh, and empowerment is a really important trend. And we're seeing that increasingly with technology enabling people to access information um, worldwide and even get access to data that they otherwise wouldn't have um, before these advancements. Can you tell me a little bit about how Bowhead Health is empowering your customers, um, I guess indeed patients? Yeah, thank you. And, and um, also just thank you for organizing this salon. Um, it's our first one and hopefully it's not our last. Um, yes. So in terms of, um, empowerment so we at, at bowhead we feel very strongly um that about um, um about the fact that when customers are empowered um through you know feeling especially in the context of health um through um developing or to, through gaining personalized um support through data um through um um one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with um with practitioners they they feel more empowered, so they feel more empowered to change their health and to change their behaviors, their health patterns. Um, so I think that um, that's something that we feel um, is um, sort of a non-negotiable um, health empowerment, and we feel very strongly um, to focus on um, building products and um, creating opportunities that um, are directly focused on um, helping our um, our customers, um, you know, um, um, change their behaviors. And so empowerment is very important. And we think that empowerment um, can um, be supported through, um, through patients and customers getting better access to health. So I think that one of the biggest issues right now is um, customers, um, especially in the context of Bowhead, um, when, somebody, when, when somebody has a health issue, um, it's very difficult um, to navigate the healthcare system. So, you know, if someone has, say, for example, low energy um, or is questioning maybe low vitamin D um, in their um, um, or, or, you know, wondering whether they have an allergy to something. Um, it's really kind of difficult for them to understand where to go, um, who, to, who to see, and often they'll go and see a medical practitioner, depending on the healthcare system. Um, they, they may get a blood test or a saliva test um, or, you know, some form of a lab test, um, or they might be told that they're, you know, they, they have to go and, um, and go home until, you know, they have a more pronounced system. So with Bowhead, we feel like um, by offering health um, at home um, and offering um, data in the form of biometric tests that are specifically um, helping our, our customers, um, giving our customers access to that data uh, versus them having to do a test and then wait for the test result, form another, go, for, go for another appointment um, and then potentially fall off on their path. Um, we feel like that will allow them to um, just to stay motivated. And of course, when people are motivated, when people are empowered, um, they take better care of themselves and ultimately um, take better care of the world. 
Thank you, Dr. Rhea and Francisco, you're the head of product. And from what I understand, I'm relatively new to this. I'm actually um, not a, an expert at all. I'd be what you'd call a patient. So I understand that we've got Bowhead, which is a device that dispenses uh, supplements um, at this stage and potentially vitamins and, and other medicine in the future that is personalized towards the needs of the person. Can you talk a little bit about how you, uh, I guess, decided to um, use uh, testing and bio, I guess, what's the word, um, biometric information in this way and apply it to a dispenser of this sort in the home? Because typically this is something that you would go to your GP to give you advice on. So my question to you is what is the role of uh, general practitioners and doctors in the future when you've got access to this level of rich personalised health information at your fingertips? Thank you very much. Uh, and that's a great question. And to highlight what Aria is saying is that we are trying to complement uh, the existing system with general pr practitioners. You know, as a as a user or as a, as a human being myself, I'm curious about what my levels of vitamin D or cortisol are at the moment. And in doing some research, really the only way I can get that information is by ordering a at-home test kit, wait for the box to arrive at my home, and then do a prick of my finger, get a blood sample, and then send that back into a laboratory. Uh, so there's multiple levels of innovation that we're tackling. So it's, it is quite an ambitious uh, product plan that we're trying to accomplish at Bowhead. But we understand that if we're able to partner with the right people to bring uh, validated diagnostics that, for example, you can within two minutes, read a vitamin D level uh, at home yourself and then place that diagnostic cartridge into the bowhead device, which then uses an optic system to read uh, the calorimetric algorithm of, kind of what your level, what the color on the cartridge represents. And then from that, be able to personalize the dose. We think that that innovation in itself uh, presents a really op good opportunity um, to just help people understand where they're at in their in their lives versus just making a decision based on marketing. Um, we, all, we all know that vitamin D is very important. A, a lot of there's a lot of research that suggests that 50% of the people are vitamin D deficient. But the, the question is, who are those 50%? So in this chat, we've got four people, which two of us are, are actually vitamin D? D deficient? Do we just go to the store and buy vitamin D uh, because of marketing or can we actually have a easy to use test that we can take that can tell us that? So th that's really the, the mission and our, our goal is to be able to provide easy and convenient and secure uh, more than anything tests at home. So you've said easy, convenient and secure tests, but what about accurate? Lindsay, Boo, I wonder if you have a question. Yes, yeah, so I have a few questions. So what are the things you're measuring? So you mentioned vitamin D and what else? Yeah, so we're going to be measuring um, vitamin D. We're going to be measuring the hormone panel. So we're uh, prioritizing the stress hormones. So cortisol, DHEA. Um, we also have the sex hormones. Um, we have progesterone, testosterone, estrogen on our list. Um, we're also going to be co-developing um, and we're, and we're co-developing these tests um, with a, um, a, a laboratory manufacturing facility and lab in Southern California, um, malaria and tuberculosis. Um, and we're also uh, considering luteinizing hormones, so for fertility. Right, that makes sense. And this is all from blood samples that people take themselves. So that's people taking themselves through a blood prick or through saliva samples. So vitamin D will be, will be, um, will be blood-based mm. and then the hormones are going to be hormone-based. I mean, sorry, saliva-based. Right. Okay. I didn't realize you could uh, accurately quantify that in, in saliva. Yeah. So there's been quite a lot of innovation in the um, in the hormone space, and so um, actually, there's one lab that's come out with dried urine um, testing for um, for uh, cortisol and DHEA. Uh, but for the for cortisol and DHEA, as long as you um, test it over four points throughout the day. Um, that's um, a, 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 based on our research and the, and the different um, labs we've connected with. Um, that's uh, quite a reliable test. Right. There you go. 
I, I have a question because um, you mentioned that uh, I know that Bohad's doing an international coin offering, and in your in my research of you, I know that you're putting health data on the blockchain. Now, the blockchain I came from financial services, so I know it as a tool that can um, be a database for say um, uh, information about somebody's securities. But health data, how does it? I guess how does it work? Can you explain to us why you made that choice with your with your company? Um, and you cut out for just a moment, um, but I but I'm I'm pretty sure I got that. Uh, Francisco, do you feel do you uh, feel interested in answering that? Because um, considering you're the blockchain expert in the company, yeah, definitely. And and there's very there's a lot of similarities uh, in the way that blockchain is being used and is being projected to being used uh, for financial services. When you look at healthcare, and your financial information is is and should be secured as well as your health data. So for example, with the blockchain, uh, every person will have their private key. So you, you sign up to the Bowhead Health blockchain, you'll have a private key, which then you can produce different sets of public keys, uh, which then provides uh, a poor, uh, basically a protocol where, where different services can upload and amend a distributed ledger. So for example, you have your general practitioner, practitioner as you mentioned earlier, you could provide them with uh, a public key that has most of your health data. But then if you download a fitness application, uh, which you would like to have as part of your general health data, but you don't necessarily want to give that fitness app full access to your health history, that's something that you can actually regulate through permissions, which the blockchain is uh, extremely good at. So the, the permissions element is an extremely important part of why we see blockchain as a huge opportunity for healthcare, as well as the distributed ledger, which ensures uh, security and uh, interoperability between uh, different practitioners. So for example, if you're, if you break a leg and your doctor's not available and your doctor's not in town, uh, you may provide a temporary public key to uh, a temporary physician. So, and, and at which point after you have your cast and you walk out of the hospital uh, and you start the healing process, you can take that public key away and then pass uh, the, the new data to your uh, general practitioner quite seamlessly. So there's, there's many benefits uh, in tying healthcare to the blockchain, but uh, the, one I, the ones I mentioned are, are some of the most fundamental. Thank you, Francisco. We have with us Dr. Matthew McGann joining from Canberra. Matt, you run healthhorizons.com, which is a aggregator of all of the health innovations in the world so that humanity can track and access them uh, as these advances are taking place. Um, do you have any questions for our experts in Toronto or LA, uh, having had a look at the bowhead and noting that it's going to add quite something very different to the health as we currently know. Yeah, so we have quite a high level view. Maddie, I'm gonna ask you to turn your volume up, please. I might have to just talk into my mic for now. Yes. Uh, is this about, this will work for yeah. now? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, we get quite a high level view of all the new advances happening in health and all the new startups and companies trying to go about it. And we haven't seen many blockchain ones, so that's quite interesting, um, quite good to see. Um, I think it would be good. I'm in Canberra, the um, capital, and you guys probably don't know, but the, the, um, we're moving to a centralized health record system in Australia. And uh, there was recently, recently a security breach and that became national news. And if that's something that the blockchain could help with, that would be great because the government's very worried about that at the moment. And they're even questioning the whole idea of a centralized repository now. <laughs> so that, that's some relevant news that could be useful. Um, I was wondering about your journey because uh, the we've learned that the journey of getting something out in health is uh, difficult, but not only difficult, but changing. So depending on what you do, um, things aren't as simple as getting regulatory approval and just going to market, especially if you're introducing new technologies like yourselves. So I noticed you're trying to do, um, you're going to do an ICO next week, which sounds really exciting. I just wanted to know more about that and how that works. Sure. And did you want to know about our journey pre-ICO? 
Um, and, or okay, would you, are you yeah. looking? Okay. Um, and also I, I think it would be helpful because it does feel like, um, you know, our goals are quite ambitious and um, it would make me helpful just to let you know sort of how we're, how we're operating and what steps we're taking. Um, so, you know, our, our end goal is to have this, have this device that's a two in one that will both test for, you know, certain biomarkers, um, certain hormones, certain vitamins um, in the blood and through saliva. Um, and it'll also dispense in real time nutritional supplements um, and medicine that are targeted um, to our customers' unique needs. Um, but um, we know that, um, you know, that, that, that process will take a while. Um, F, F, FDA approvals, um, you know, we're, we're estimating, we're, we've, through our partner, we've been told that it might take about a year and it'll take about uh, three to six months to develop our tests. So, um, you know, we're estimating a year and a half, but you never know, like things, you know, it, it, it could be, it could, that, that could, that could be shortened, that could be delayed for some particular reason. We do feel confident um, with our time frame because our partner, our partners do have experience um, in filing for regulatory approvals um, with their, um, with their tests. They are the leaders in um, both fertility and pregnancy tests. Um, and they, they sell their tests currently through uh, one of the leading pharmacies in the U.S. So they have experience with this. Um, but in um, w what we feel strongly about, you know, first building a community and, and, um, and through that, so it, in parallel, while we develop our tests, we have a couple of different missions um, and, um, and pathways. And so one is that we're gonna be launching with an app and that app is our starting place. We're gonna launch this fall and that app is going to allow us to uh, build community. We'll be able to um, um, bring in uh, customers to be able to input their health data and we'll still be able to connect them to labs to order tests. So they'll still have the same experience except we'll be connecting them to third party labs. Uh, versus, you know, to getting them sent the tests at home, um, but that'll allow us to, you know, refine our refine our model and get a sense of whether, um, you know, what's working, what's not, and how to and how to optimize the experience. Um, so we'll at in this case, our our customers will actually have access to a lot more tests. They'll have access to genetic tests, um, um, food intolerance tests, and uh, and those, you know, those those test kits will arrive. Um, within two to five business days, they'll be able to provide their sample. They'll be sent back to the lab. And then they'll still get their recommendations and results um, in the app, through the app, as they would if they were to um, use the test at home. So the experience will still be quite similar, except we'll be able to move to market much quicker. Um, and, and then the practitioner on the other end, um, who's looking at that data, will be able to then provide recommendations. And so the supplements will still be, um, will still be recommended, sub supplements and lifestyle recommendations. And, um, and rather than them the supplements arriving in cartridges and being added to the, the device for now, we'll have them um, um, sent to the, to the customers and they'll just be able to take them. So we won't have the dispenser right up front. Um, we might also move to market with the device as a dispenser alone versus a despite the versus the device um, as a dispenser with the test reader function. And so we're going to build our device in a modular function in a modular way. So we can just add on that other feature. Um, and we're also planning to um, enter the developing markets. So, you know, say our, our tests do take longer than anticipated, um, we, will, we'll, we will enter markets that, that don't require FDA approvals um, so that we can, you know, we can do a couple of things in parallel. And, and to add what, and friend, to, to, to what uh, Ria is, is talking about, I, I've been tracking the, uh, the Bitcoin space first as an investment and most recently as a framework. So seeing a lot of the developments that are happening with uh, Ethereum, with its innovations around the smart contracts and how we're able to use smart contracts around healthcare to really leverage this distributed ledger um, within the healthcare space and, and create a model of uh, crypto economics where users are incentivized to provide their anonymous health data in a method that is both secure and also transparent uh, to patients around the world. So the initial coin offering or token sale, uh, as, as we call it, we, we see as a huge opportunity, not only as, as an, a great opportunity to finance the company, but as Ria mentioned, to start building a community. So we've already uh, started doing pre-sales of our 
of our bowhead token, which will be called the anonymized health token. And we've seen a, a great reception really around the world uh, from entrepreneurs, from doctors. And it's been an incredible experience being able to connect with people around the world. Uh, and the, the model of the anonymized health token is that users are able to buy this and AHT is the name of the token. So that they're able to buy this HT. And once the token sale is over, uh, users will be able to earn this token by first completing health related surveys, then by providing uh, you know, their, their health data or diagnostic data uh, through the blockchain in a secure anonymous fashion. Um, to research institutions and pharmaceutical companies. So the the revenue share that's created is 70% of the funds will go directly to the patient that is contributing their anonymous health data, and 30% of the revenue will go to all the token holders. Uh, so we, we see it as a fantastic way to build an incentivized model around the community of people sharing their anonymous health data to advance uh, medical research. This is really interesting, Francisco, because <clears throat> you, uh, many people are increasingly becoming concerned about having more and more of their identity or markers or data online, with technology having access to it. There was um, article earlier saying that Google can listen to what we're saying just through our phones now. So whether we intend to or not, sometimes our information is captured um, in, in ways that can be you know, placed on the cloud or used potentially by other people. And here we have the opportunity for our health data to be put on the blockchain, which you're saying is uh, a, a solution that actually protects the privacy of patients and users rather than compromises it. Um, how, how, I guess, can patients become comfortable with that, knowing that more of their information is on this, um, on this piece of technology that others could get access to? Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, the concerns that people might have around that? Yes, and absolutely. And going back to the example of the financial services model where users today are able to have a Bitcoin wallet where they are the ones that have a private key where they have a recovery seed. So if that recovery seed and that password is lost, that wallet simply cannot be recovered. And the funds that are stored within the blockchain cannot be recovered and are lost forever. And this has happened to, to many people. It's, it's virtually unhackable. If you lose your key, if you lose your seed recovery seed, uh, th those funds are lost. So very much, using those same principles to protect uh, patients' data is, is mirrored in this example, where if you lose your private key, uh, if you lose your recovery seed, your, your health data is, is encrypted uh, w within this distributed ledger and nobody can have access to it. So that's, that's kind of a, fu that's a fundamental new way of thinking uh, for us and the world in terms of storing your your health data on this distributed ledger but it's something that we feel in terms of the options that are out there uh, with you know these large companies uh, both in the technology space and the pharmaceutical space that want to own your data we think that this is a, a good secure solution uh, that that patients and users can feel comfortable with that's right another hey, Lindsay, I, um, uh, I'm gonna have a question for you and then you can ask your <laughs> if that's okay. Um, so we're talking about personalised healthcare here, and I know that you're doing research into life extension. But what's the value for uh, patients being able to um, have a more personalised approach to their healthcare, and how can that help to elongate their lives? Yeah, so that leads into the question I was going to ask. Rather than looking at uh, the sex hormones and uh, things he's just looking at, uh, for example, vitamin D, what about just taking standard blood tests that your doctor would order and putting that on the blockchain? You know, standard path tests. So your, your glucose, your HbA1c, your uh, cholesterol. Why not put that on the blockchain? Because that actually is a useful advice. Um, I hate to say it, I'm not sure that of the utility of um, 
you know, vitamin D and whatnot. So I think that's just one example of what we could store on, on a health record. Um, in, an, in an ideal world, our vision is that you would even be able to use, uh, for example, you can, you can even store your fitness patterns on this uh, blockchain. Right. Or you could also store, as you mentioned, your cholesterol levels uh, or your physical, um, all the way down to even uh, your genetic data that's stored within this, this blockchain. So we, we don't only see it as um, just storing vitamins necessarily, but we see that as kind of the, the first uh, thing that we can offer an easy to use diagnostic that we can then perfectly link up into the blockchain. But it's, it's definitely just the beginning of the vision. Yeah, I think the uh, data management aspect is a lot more useful than the um, than the device. Sorry to say, but I, I think that's where really where the potential lies. Uh, and, and and indeed, because this is a pioneering and new uh, technology, there's always going to be opportunities for expansion and growth into even more areas. But you have to start from somewhere. And speaking of which, one of our um, idea potters, Boone Hem, who's joining us from California, has got a question um, about what the symptoms are of vitamin D deficiency? Um, yeah, so, you know, there are a lot of symptoms. Um, physical, physically, I think, you know, a lot of people experience fatigue, um, low energy, um, sleep disruption, um, and, um, you know, I, weight gain, um, um, there's um, just some poor metabolism issues. So there are a lot of symptoms, um, weakness, muscle weakness. Um, often it's, it is a little bit hard to, um, to diagnose or to, um, to determine whether somebody is vitamin D deficient. So generally, um, you know, when somebody provides a health survey as well as completes a test, it's um, a lot easier, of course, to determine whether, you know, to detect uh, vitamin D deficiency. And I think that um, it's one of these, it's one of these, one, one of the reasons why we feel called to um, to explore vitamin D as a test and make it available to our customers is because half the population, you know, is showing deficiency in this uh, very important vitamin and uh, it's often going undetected. So because it's not that easy to detect, um, people aren't um, being tested for it. And, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why we feel called to, um, to having it more accessible to our customers. And ladies and gentlemen who are in the audience, feel free to put your Q&A in to ask Dr. Rhea, Francisco, Matt and Lindsay your questions. I know that we've got a couple of questions from the audience in the Q&A section now. Uh, one of our colleagues, Rahul, I know has joined and he usually has some good questions. So I've just made a shout out to you, my friends. Um, Mark Smith has said medical information can be overwhelming. The idea of self-serve sounds daunting depending on your age, health and education, it seems like one could easily get lost or make incorrect or unhealthy decisions. And then Boone has commented, it seems overwhelming at first, but you'll get the hang of it. I personally have been keeping track of my health with apps and notes to assist me with my doctor visits. Uh, can keeping track of your medical information be overwhelming? There's a huge quantified self movement and there's wearables for almost everything. We even have children's tech wearables to ensure that uh, their parents can get informed insights uh, and have a data driven approach to ensuring their kids have happy, healthy lives while they're at school or while they're at play. Um, how can all of this information be empowering and easy to use um, rather than overwhelming? Um, Francisco, do you want to talk a little bit about the app or would you like me to go ahead? Yeah. Okay. 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 Great. So, you know, we, um, we agree that, um, that, um, oftentimes, uh, getting, you know, taking, getting in a, a lot of health information can feel very overwhelming and, uh, and it can result in people falling off. And that's the one thing we don't want. We want people to feel empowered and motivated to, um, you know, keep living healthy lives. So, um, we've, you know, we've taken that information and we're, um, building an app that, um, and, and, and we're building an app that's going to be, um, very user friendly. So when data is, um, is shared with our customers, they are going to be receiving that data in really easy to understand graphs and charts 
um, and um, and in a way that's you know that's very um, it's just very directive. And they'll be able to ask questions. Um, we'll have support. Um, there'll be lots of education. So again, education in a very simple way. We'll have videos. Um, it'll it'll be done in a way that you know that um, that ensures that people are feeling empowered. And also, it is a community, and we're going to be we're going to be taking in lots of um, community feedback. So the more feedback we get, the better we can uh, optimize our platform. So it's a. Uh... This is such a big topic and I can't help but feel that the way you get super passionate about bringing um, personalizing health in this way for you know billions of people is that you've had your own personal journey with health and uh, really sort of care about the evolution of your own personal well-being. Um, I guess, Matt, I'm going to ask you this question and then Francisco and Rhea. You're a theoretical physicist. How did you become involved in Health Horizons and what inspired you to pursue this uh, new venture in aggregating all of health, um, the health innovations for humanity and making them accessible to us all? Like, What is your purpose for um, being interested in this space? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I can answer that with a story. Uh, when I was a kid, I guess about nine years old or something like that, I was um, trying to do what kids do and uh, pretend like I was more mature as than I was and I decided to test that by uh, sitting myself down torturing myself by just watching the news for half an hour I guess I thought if I could just watch the news for half an hour maybe I'm a bit more mature than I thought and I remember watching it and then toward the end um, I was extremely bored but then there was a news article about a new health um, I think it was about a new cancer drug or something so I'm 10 the year is 1994 and uh, the um, the, uh, the, the news report said uh, this university have developed this potential treatment for cancer and um, it should be available in 10 years time or something like that and I <laughs> got quite excited like it's finally paid off watching the news for half an hour looks like they're going to kill cancer in 10 years so I ran to the uh, my mom and said hey guess what there's this thing on the news they're going to they found this new treatment this is all very exciting and mom's like oh don't worry about that they always say that and I don't know what happens to it. So I always thought that was a bit weird. Um, and then later I went to uni, then decided not to stay in academia and wanted to do something real in the world. And so I was talking to a local entrepreneur here who worked in the health commercialization space. And he really found the same problems I did as a, as a nine year old, uh, 10 year old. It's like, how, how, um, there's so much being done. The challenges facing humanity as far as they're progressing in health, to me, doesn't seem like a problem in effort. To me, it seems like a problem in uh, focusing on the right problems or, or uh, um, coordinating what everyone's doing, at least being aware of everything that's available. And so that's what we set out to do with Health Horizon. So it's, it's the idea is that if someone saw that on the news, because it still happens to this day, this university have discovered this new genetic marker that could lead to a cure for Parkinson's and it might be available in 10 years. We are aiming for a future where someone sees that, says, oh, my uncle might have Parkinson's, um, search Health Horizon for Parkinson's and then see that innovation there and follow it. And then you get notified as it progresses. So we're able to categorize all the innovations around the world in terms of what they are, what they do, and what stage they're at. And so you can, um, uh, something resonated with me, what Ria said earlier, she talked about um, health empowerment and uh, we use the same words, but more in terms of information about what's coming, because uh, especially for people, people like us who are young, the things that will affect us aren't what's available now. It's the stuff that will be available in 10, 20 years. So yeah, that's what we've uh, set out to do. Thanks Matt, how about yourself, Francisco? What's your journey into pursuing this as uh, your your one thing? I, I think it all started uh, growing up, being active and participating in competitive swimming and always trying to understand my body better. Uh, so health has always been a, a very important part of my life. And I just getting into my 30s, starting to think about getting old, I guess, starting to wonder how my body's aging and what kind of diagnostics I could have uh, and researching that you know, d diagnostics uh, 
take a long time or you have to go into the hospital. There's nothing readily available and convenient at your fingertips. And I feel like as a society, we've, apart from health, we've advanced so much in that area. I mean, everything is accessible. We have, we have Uber for everything practically, except for uh, diagnostics. So uh, doing some more research, uh, talk, talking to Ria and also to doctors and scientists and understanding what it is that we need to develop or who we need to partner with to bring this to the marketplace has uh, kept me really excited about the Bowhead journey. Very cool. And Ria, we've had Subham ask us, what diet can play a role in the defeat of depression? Which I think I do want, I would love to ask you that question and then <laughs> um, invite you to share your personal health journey because I know it's a passion of yours. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that's a million dollar question. <laughs> I think, um, I think, um, you know, um, that that's, that's a, if, if we all knew what the diet was to uh, defeat depression, that would be, that would be incredible. I think that um, eating a low inflammatory diet, so a diet that's free from foods that are, you know, making you feel low energy, fatigued, inflam um, highly packaged foods, I would say is a place, a good place to start. And of course, then supplementing your diet with, you know, um, lots of greens, um, a decent amount of low glycemic fruit, um, some, some high quality, um, some high quality um, uh, grains. Um, I think that for a lot of people, they find that when they cut out the inflammatory foods, for some of them, it might be dairy, it might be gluten, some of their usual suspects, they, you know, they start to feel better energetically. Um, but it's very dependent on, on again, uh, um, on, you know, on your specific needs as an individual. And that's why I, um, I'm a supporter of testing um, because, you know, ultimately you can just, you can do a lot of experimentation. Um, and that's great if you have the built-in motivation and empowerment. But if you don't, um, it can be very disappointing quickly and you can very easily fall off. So um, a little bit about my journey. So um, I, so when I was young, um, and I actually in this diet that I'm talking about, this inflammatory diet is something that um, I, um, I, you know, um, 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 indulged in growing up. And, um, and so I was uh, diagnosed with um, rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune, autoimmune condition at a very young age, at age 13. And that led to um, a number of years um, living off of um, was just being given lots of different types of medication. Um, I had a lot of um, um, change diagnoses, so I was I was t you know I was I was told I had um, different forms of chronic um, chronic inflammatory conditions um, throughout my childhood, and uh, I developed chronic constipation. Um, I, I developed irritable bowel disease. So when I was young, I was quite ill, and you know nobody ever told me that. Um, that I might want to look at my lifestyle, um, what I was eating, how I was treating my body, how I, the, the kinds of thoughts I had, um, you know, what what I was um, what I was absorbing on a daily basis. Um, and so I, um, when I got into my twenties, I realized that I had a number of deficiencies um, and imbalances. I was low B twelve, I was low iron, I was low D three, I was low magnesium, and um, and you know, slowly I started to um, develop a little bit more um, interest in this world. Um, and that actually led me to pursuing a PhD. Um, so uh, when I started my PhD and moved into the area of nutritional sciences, that was really my first entry point into nutritional uh, or into the idea of like nutrition as medicine even. I was very much science focused. I studied biomedical sciences in undergrad. And it wasn't until um, a quarter way through my PhD where I actually fell very ill. And, um, and I was really just forced into rethinking uh, my past. And I was, I'm very grateful for that moment because it was this moment where I actually got to think, um, just, just to kind of reflect on my life and think about, um, you know, um, maybe, maybe exploring other forms of therapy, alternative medicine. And I didn't really have a clue of what alternative medicine was. I, you know, I was studying nutrition, but you really, you know, when you're at a molecular level, you really don't take a high level approach and zoom out to see how um, that, you know, take a more of a holistic approach. Um, so I, I got, I just got a lot of feedback 
um, because I started asking new questions. And it was very, very difficult to navigate the healthcare system. Um, it took me 10 years for me to come up with a personalized protocol, uh, resolve my inefficiencies and deficiencies in my body, uh, find a diet and a new lifestyle really that allowed me to feel empowered and help others. And so, you know, I was very privileged. I got the chance to do my PhD and to, and to um, you know, just get access to all this information, but that um, I realized that most people aren't as lucky. And so that led me on a path of, of becoming a health leadership coach and really understanding, um, working with people from all over the world and really, and including, including uh, Justin, our, our, our colleague, Justin, um, and, um, and really gaining an understanding of, you know, what do people actually need? Um, to feel their best. And, you know, that's um, one of the reasons why we do feel so called to looking at some of these specific biomarkers. Um, it was, uh, you know, I've worked with a, a number of, of young change makers and entrepreneurs and leaders and, um, and it's, you know, time and time again, um, um, you know, testing has shown that, um, that they, you know, th through, through these imbalances and through our, through interventions, through nutritional supplementation, um, they're actually able to optimize their health um, and resolve their body's inefficiencies. And so, um, you know, with Bowhead, I feel really excited about, um, about um, our path forward because we get the chance to help people in a very convenient and accessible way. And, and, and when we're offering such convenience, you know, and uh, personalized support, it really, um, it maintains this empowerment, right? So people don't end up falling off and they, um, and they're able to, you know, maintain, maintain the, um, the, their, their, um, their stamina and their, their uh, momentum. Thank you so much, Dr. Rhea. And it's so interesting to see that Matt's story, story started out with him watching the news as a kid. Francisco's was being an athlete. Yours was actually ill health. Lindsay, Boy, I'm just going to ask you the same question before we touch on Rahul's question at the end and also Sky's and close up the salon. Thank you so much, everybody, for all of your questions and engagement throughout. Um, why did you decide to get involved in life extension and studying what you're studying, Lindsay? Uh, I've always wanted to be a scientist in my entire life, and that's all I've ever done, is a short answer. <laughs> From being a little kid to going to uni to doing a PhD, Ever since then, I haven't done anything but be a scientist. But I do want to return to an earlier question as to what diet treats depression. I'm sorry, I just am extremely skeptical of this advice that changing your diet to a supposedly less inflammatory diet can treat depression. There's very limited evidence on that. They are, depression is a very complex disease. Please go and see a mental health professional. Uh, the only intervention really that um, can treat depression, uh, or at least in a limited way treat depression, is exercise. Um, but again, the problem with depression is that uh, you lose the motivation to exercise. So um, back to another question earlier uh, in regards to uh, waiting your way through all these data, whether it can be a bit confusing for people. Again, go and see a GP or a health professional. Uh, I do fear that, that uh, innovations like this will just lead to an epidemic of uh, hypochondriacs, to be honest. Uh, sometimes a, a, a slight vitamin deficiency is not the end of the world. Uh, data can be very easily misinterpreted, so please go and see a health professional. One thing that I will add in there is that it's always really important to have lots of different points of view. Um, it's also really important to ensure that cases of the minority don't undermine cases of the majority. And um, I am conscious that we've got two more questions that are quite long that I would love to get to, and I'm going to ask them now. The first one is from Rahul, because I did promise Sky I would end with hers. Rahul from Sydney has said, I'm wondering if Bohead has worked on applications in the aged care sector. Retirement villages generally have a low carer resident ratio and an instrument to monitor mm -hmm. real time and daily health. Um, so that would be a boon. I'll put that out to you, Francisco. So, so we have not worked uh, within the aged care sector. It's something that we'd like to include in our pipeline of, of innovation, but it's not something that uh, we're going to be focusing on, at least in the short term. Well, speaking of uh, the term, Sky's question is, what is your picture of how this evolves in 50 years? Do you imagine there's going to be one blockchain, like an enormous universal database of all the information of the whole population, or does each industry have its own blockchain? Would medical data be mixed with other personal data, such as spending habits or travel habits? And would it be regulated by the anonymous hacker community? By who? who would own or manage the blockchain? Anybody? 
a pretty broad speaking question, Sky, and um, almost in the realm of, um, certainly a few years ago, we would have said that would be floating with the realm of science fiction. Francisco, as the blockchain uh, enthusiast and expert, do you have a view on that? Have you formed a view on that yet? Well, the short answer is I don't know, but I think that the whole point is to put the power into a person's hands. So depending on who you'd like to share that information with, people should have the option to you know, participate in certain uh, health-related surveys or programs, but at the end of the day, it's very important that people have the power and control of their own health data versus uh, a company having complete unfettered access to uh, population's health data. Thank you very much. And I think that's about all that we've got time for. Thank you so much for everybody that's joined. The one question I will end this along with, and I'm participants, is in one word, can you share what you believe is the future of health? I'm going to start with you, Lindsay Boo. Hmm. Exercise. Excellent. Francisco. Personalization. Personalization. I'm going to ask Matt McGann, who's going to be on screen very soon. Actually, Rhea, I'll ask you. Convenience. Convenience. Matt? Uh, I was going to say personalization as well, so <laughs> I'll agree. <laughs> you get another one. I get another one. Oh, geez. Um, uh, well, I want to say exercise now that I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll add one for you. How about the future of health is quality? More quality health for a longer period of time. And speaking of quality, this has been such a quality salon with lots of debate and discussion, and I'm glad that we've had a robust um, views from both our speakers and the questions from our audience. I really want to thank everybody that's joined. So Dr. Lindsay Wu. Dr. Matthew McGann, Francisco, Diaz Matoma, and Maria Meta, the CEO of Bowhead Health. Ladies and gentlemen, you can go to ideapod.com, hashtag personalized health if you want to continue the discussion, ask more questions. And of course, if you have any questions for the Bowhead team, feel free to go and visit their website at bowheadhealth.com. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll catch you at the next one. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.